Revolution, everybody. Hope everybody's good. Happy to see you. Welcome, uh, Rosanna and uh, uh, Anita. And we have a special guest this morning, Colin. Colin, welcome. Before I get started, I want to well, wish everybody a happy uh, 4th of July is coming up next uh, Tuesday, I think. Uh, a lot of people will be traveling this weekend, so please drive safely, fly safely, and be safe uh, in your social interactions. That's really important. We got a lot to talk about today. Uh, the Mom for Liberty, which is a right-wing uh, group, is descending on Philadelphia. Uh, there's some protests uh, developing around it. We'll be talking about that. And the Supreme Court d committed a supreme injustice this week, outlawing affirmative action as we uh, know it. We'll be digging into uh, that. Then Mr. Trump in search of new enemies. You know, first it was Hillary Clinton, and then it was immigrants. And then it was Muslims, and now reviving the Red Scare. Boogeyman! I don't look like a boogeyman, do I? Don't answer. Don't answer that question. And then finally, our mailbag. Uh, but let's start with uh, Moms for Liberty. Colin, welcome again. Uh, the Washington Post, I'm sorry, Examiner, earlier in mm -hmm. the week, had a big story saying that if you're not with Moms for Liberty, you're with the young communists, which is a rather narrow framing of the issue. What provoked them to make that statement? What's going on in Philly? Yes, well, thank you, Joe, for um, having me today to tell everyone what's going on. Um, so Moms for Liberty is this extremist um, group um, designated by the Southern Poverty Law Center as an extremist group. Um, they are a right-wing kind of network um, organizing uh, a lot of um, moms, per se, uh, to uh, take over school boards, um, to institute policies like they did in a Central Bucks school district, which is just outside Philadelphia, banning pride flags in classrooms, um, and supporting really like the agenda of people like Ronald, Ron DeSantis. Um, to uh, whitewash history, um, to uh, erase uh, queer people and uh, queer youth uh, in the classroom, and overall create a hostile environment. Now, in Philadelphia, um, we as the Young Communist League, uh, alongside uh, ACT UP Philadelphia, have uh, taken a leading role in um, forming and organizing the opposition to this national summit. Um, the Moms for Liberty Summit is being held at the Marriott downtown um, from uh, yesterday, June 29th to July 2nd. And uh, we, we were out there um, even uh, during the last week of May. Um, we've been out at the Marriott um, protesting, telling them that we will be back um, unless they cancel this, which they did not. And um, so uh, I think uh, that Washington Examiner uh, article reflects um, that the Moms for Liberty and overall this right-wing ecosystem of uh, hate um, is recognizing that um, the Young Communist League and uh, you know socialists and uh, communists across the country are putting up uh, the strong opposition uh, to their agenda and um, confronting them with uh, a message of joy and love and solidarity. I love your message of joy and love and solidarity. That's, <laughs> those are the values that we should, in fact, be promoting. This Moms for Liberty group arose during COVID, didn't it, mm -hmm. uh, Colin? It, they, 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 they came into being opposing uh, mask mandates they they mm -hmm. came into being opposing vaccines who who's afraid of getting vaccines so what freedom are they standing for freedom to get sick and die Colin? Right. <laughs> i yeah i mean they they see it as um uh taking control 
um, they're, they're always talking about um, we're here for parents' rights. Um, but it's a very narrow vision. Um, and if anything, I any par parental rights that um, uh, re removes the bodily autonomy and just general autonomy of young people, young people who are finding out about themselves, uh, you know, maybe asking questions uh, about their gender identity or sexual orientation. Um, I do not um, condone like any parental rights uh, that tries to squash that. And um, that is exactly what Moms for Liberty um, is trying to promote. And um, just last night, uh, speaking of freedom, uh, they had their opening reception at the Museum of the American Revolution here in Philadelphia. Um, now, this, this brought up a whole lot of contradictions because, um, in fact, uh, staff at the museum, uh, they, they voiced uh, internal opposition uh, to the museum leadership hosting the moms. And um, a lot actually um, even resigned in protest. Um, and they've been uh, working with us um, and uh, just offering insights. But truly, I think the Museum of the American Revolution has uh, tarnished its reputation uh, by hosting this group. So how have you been received by the public in, in, in Philadelphia? Are people coming to the uh, uh, demonstrations? Where are they taking place and how mm -hmm. can folks get involved? I mean, the public uh, support um, has frankly been overwhelming. Uh, we've been building a broad coalition um, on leftist groups, socialists, I, and liberal. Um, we are also in coalition with uh, groups like Defense of Democracy and um, folks in the suburbs, like in Delaware County. Um, and uh, our demonstrations, uh, last night we had it at the Museum of the American Revolution, but from now on it'll be at the Marriott. Uh, 12th and Filbert Street in Phil Center City, Philadelphia. That's near Reading Terminal Market. And uh, these demonstrations, as you can see on this uh, agenda, uh, we've been doing them as dance party protests, um, thinking that the best way to uh, counter um, this hateful bigotry is by showing um, some uh, queer joy and um, just a whole lot of gay and trans people having fun and uh, shaking their thing. Um, so yeah, these are happening uh, from 9 to 9 today, Friday, June 30th, tomorrow, July 1st, and then we're going to close out on Sunday, July 2nd, um, with another dance party protest from 9 a.m. to about 2 p.m., or until the last uh, of these moms get back on their buses and go back to where they came from. Well, thank you very much. I uh, thank all of the comrades and friends in Philadelphia who have taken the initiative to protest. We need to take initiative. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really important uh, in broad coalition with others, you know, because the fight against the fascist right and the neoconservative right and the social conservative, whatever kind of conservative right it is, mm -hmm. has to be a broad fight, you know. We need our They're lives. organized. We have to out organize them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, just as a co collective, uh, the Philadelphia Young Communist League, we have been learning so much through this uh, experience. And um, yeah, I, I really um, can express mm. how much, uh, uh, how proud I am of my comrades here. And uh, we are proud of you too. So keep Thank on you. doing it. That's all we Thank got you. to say. Mm -hmm. And we hope to see some of you at the Little Red Schoolhouse this summer in mm -hmm. New York, taking place the last week of July. <clears throat> Thank you very much for joining us, Colin. And uh, Thank you all. We might have you back next week to share the results of what uh, happened. Take Glad pictures, you. please, video, so we can mm -hmm. post it on the website. This is a story that needs to be told far and right wide. On. Yeah. All right, Colin. Thank Take you. care, and we'll, we'll see you next time. We're going to continue um, with a uh, discussion about what's taking place uh, a little bit south of Philly, two hours south, below the Mason-Dixon line, Washington, D.C., where the Supreme Court, Scott, welcome. The Supreme Court Thank you. overturned four decades of initiated, curiously, 
under Richard Nixon, affirmative action, which basically means that there's a recognition in this country of the historic legacy of slavery, that we're all not starting out um, in the race, so to speak, in the same place. Some people were pushed way behind. If you're Black or Native American or Latino, pushed way behind because of the historic legacy of slavery and colonialism and, and that their need for special measures, special compensatory measures to make up for past discrimination, you know? And it's been in force for 30, 40 years. Um, and the court in the last several years reaffirmed it, but then Rosanna, something happened. Trump came into office and he appointed three right-wing judges um, and they joined with the other conservatives in a majority, this is six to nine, overturning affirmative action. Bad news, Rosanna, for students of color who wanna attain a higher education and become doctors, lawyers, engineers, scientists, teachers, so on and so forth. Don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not surprised that this vote came down the way it did. Um, but I think for a lesson for us that we have to really uh, learn uh, is that voting really does matter. It matters in a way that, that affects so many people. And if you are for justice, if you are for equality, you have to also partake in the, in, in the election process because that's where, that's where things are, are, as you can see, that's where um, laws are being made and, things, and people are being affected and, and especially people who don't have a voice are being affected much more than, than others. And so I think you know, we have to <clears throat> continue the fight to bring affirmative action back uh, and and really learn the hard lesson that that voting does matter, and we have to we have to be very strategic about it. Absolutely, matters big time, and uh, because the only way now to overcome the legal decision of the court is legislatively. Anita, um, mm -hmm. you worked as a college professor, speaking. Uh, in that capacity, reflecting on your history of working with students, uh, what kind of impact is this going to have on the student population? I think it will be, it will be really uh, a, a, another burden for these colleges that want to have uh, a diverse uh, class um, to establish that. Um, it, it really is so. Um, enriching to a classroom to have a variety of people there, immigrant students, uh, students of color, uh, students from um, urban uh, areas and rural areas. Sometimes a college classroom is the first time they can all get together and exchange ideas. And the discussion is always much richer then. Um, and also the, the usual, it just seems like the ruling class doesn't want its children to have to compete with um, a lot of other children who, who, who may have not had the advantages that they had, but um, have every bit as much, uh, you know, intellectual capacity and capacity for doing good in the world, um, especially this, uh, the idea of, of uh, physicians not being able, I mean, most of this, uh, I think, decision goes to elite schools, which might not be the vast majority of people's experience. But medical schools, especially, we need a, a diverse medical, uh, uh, you know, force, a staff um, out there um, to address some of these disparities in health outcomes uh, among different groups, especially African Americans. So I think I think this is really a terrible decision that will will cause suffering down the line. And I hope colleges figure out a way. And I think they some of them will be motivated to do so to to you know, still establish a diverse class. 
Uh, speaking of figuring out a way, Scott, um, Justice Roberts left open two, uh, uh, a wrinkle and a um, exception to the ruling. The wrinkle is that uh, you can still, they can still consider admissions committees uh, a student's background uh, as a person of color, as an African American or Latino, Native American. Uh, they can't rule out their ability to tell their story and to take that story into account. But they say in that the story should not be the determining factor. So there's a little wrinkle there. And the exception, military schools, West Point, they don't want a all white officer corps because of the, <laughs> the goddamn armed forces of 40, 50% black and Latino. And they're armed. <laughs> it's not funny, so, really. What's going on, so, Scott? Well, the yeah, both of those things are really important to consider. Um, so the wrinkle, first of all, um, you know, we should remember that I think there are a lot of misconceptions about what affirmative action was and and what was uh, struck down in this recent ruling. Um, so schools, some schools chose to consider um, uh, the race of students who reported uh, uh, their race or ethnicity on their application. Um, uh, for UNC, at least, there was no requirement. Uh, I don't think for Harvard either to report uh, race or ethnicity. If a student reported, the schools could consider it alongside other factors uh, like um, athletic ability, um, you know, uh, socioeconomic circumstances, um, you know, extracurricular activities, all sorts of things, right? Um, so the, uh, the, the, yeah, the wrinkle is meaningful because schools are going to eventually find another way, but in the meantime, it's gonna be incredibly disruptive, um, especially, uh, you know, if, uh, if we think of, of historically black colleges and universities. Um, in terms of the exception, it, uh, you know, the, the idea that military schools are not subject to this ruling um, demonstrates uh, something that uh, Justice Jackson uh, brings out in her dissent um, over and over again, which is that uh, racial equality, uh, the elimination of racial disparities in, in educational access and opportunity is not just good for African Americans, for Latinos, for racially and nationally oppressed people. It's good for all of us. It's good for democracy as a whole. Um, everyone benefits, as Anita was saying, when um, colleges and universities and every institution um, is more inclusive. Uh, so, um, and by the way, I think these, these dissents, uh, the dissent of both Sotomayor and uh, Jackson, uh, they're really worth reading. Um, because uh, uh, ja Justice Jackson's dissent in particular um, reiterates sort of s uh, that government programs, government policy over many, many years now um, has uh, affirmatively acted to dole out benefits um, to uh, white people that were denied to others. Um, and so uh, the affirmative action we're talking about now is simply redressing those. It's not, um, you know, setting up new systems of, in of inequality. It's trying to finally root out the old ones and, um, you know, get to that level playing field that, that the conservative majority on the court wants to pretend already exists. Which in fact does not exist in this whole uh, color blindness is a, an excuse for um, a not so colorful racism. Uh, Anita's uh, internet just went out. We, we we hope that she'll be able to uh, 
rejoin us. Uh, but until then, um, let's continue the, uh, the the conversation. We also red alert, red alert. Supreme Court just made another ruling. Uh, Anita, the court just overturned student debt loan forgiveness. What are they trying to do? Are they like secretly working against uh, Trump and the others by coming up with these outrageous decisions that's going to broaden even versus abortion? Women rising up. Now it's today it's uh, affirmative, yesterday affirmative action. Black and Latino are going to rise up. Don't think we won't. By the way, there's a national march on Washington. August 26. That's okay. going to be a time where we're going to have to turn out, Rosanna. And now stu- young people, student loans, they, they, they've overturned the student loan forgiveness. What are they trying to do? So on, on this one, I, oh, sorry, Rosanna. You're muted. Sorry, yeah. Well, I think that they're, they're trying to choke us to death, but they they're mistaken because we have a fight be, fighting back spirit that we're going to, you know, the people aren't going to just stand uh, stand for it. We've seen it a thousand times where there's always a fight back, and and the thing is that we all have to join in this fight back. We can't just sit and watch it. We have to be part of it. And the more and more people that are part of it, the more and more result better results we'll get. All of those students who have loans that are paying they can't they can't progress other you know they can't move further because they have this huge student loan that they have to pay back <clears throat> uh, need to also step it up you know uh, join forces and, and let's all work together to to make these kinds of changes that are necessary so that uh, we we send that message that we're not going to take it anymore And that's an important message to send. Scott, you were going to say something. Yeah, I think, you know, on the student debt decision, there are two things to um, consider. One, um, and this is something that subtends both the student debt decision and the affirmative action decision, is that capital, uh, the capitalist class requires a supply of vulnerable people. It requires people who are locked in, who do not have a choice uh, except to um, take whatever role they are assigned. And um, both of those decisions are an attempt to put the greatest number of people possible in the greatest, the situation of least choice, least freedom, and most kind of dependence on capital that can be uh, procured. In terms of the student debt decision specifically, um, it seems to me that that this is really an attempt to uh, discredit Biden and to, um, you know, uh, make a, a Democratic victory in um, 2024 uh, more difficult. So student loan forgiveness is a huge demand of the people, of young people in particular, um, something capable of uh, turning out um, lots and lots of folks to uh, to vote and um, by, by blocking it, uh, by, um, you know, interfering with, with one of the Biden administration's sort of signature uh, uh, initiatives. This is, it's really a, an attack on, you know, on, on the kind of the Democratic Party and the possibility of um, winning in 2024. But is it going to discredit the Democrats and the president and the Congress and those who, or is it going to discredit the court and the GOP and the loan companies who, who didn't support it? Is it both? In other words, doesn't it have the potential to boomerang? You know, it could. that's back at you, you know, and though, you know, you, you can't wait for it to happen spontaneously. That sentiment and anger, you know, has to be organized. But that's where organized forces, conscious forces have to come in, you know, it, it, it seems to uh, me these decisions are so outrageous. I mean, <clears throat> they, 
They didn't outlaw legacy admissions, Anita. If your daddy went to, your mother went to uh, Harvard or Yale or, um, you know, University of Pennsylvania, University of Texas, Michigan, the Ivy League, you are automatically admitted. Anita, if you can hear me, say, hey, Joe. <laughs> I don't know if Anita can hear me. Anyway, uh, for Rosanna, I think she's frozen. Yeah. I think she's frozen. Okay. Could we, so uh, they didn't you... have all those things. You know, if you you if you qualify on the on the uh, canoeing team, they didn't outlaw think... that. But, huh? Well, I think that's the you know that's the the, the plus that we bring as communists is we get, bring that clarity and we we ask those important questions that are not out there uh, uh, more more readily. And asking these kinds of questions of how it really shows that inequality and the the injustice of these rulings, because it does it's not inclusive to everyone. It's just a, you know once again it points to the racist to the racism and uh, of nature of this ruling. And as Scott said, it's it's putting in further peril those already in peril putting those who are most insecure in greater insecurity right. in an effort to continually uh, have a class of people who are constantly fighting for survival. Uh, and so they feel like they can do anything, pay them the lowest wages, break their unions, make them pay the most amount of money, shut them out of education, do whatever you want, uh, and, they're, and thereby splitting the working class and continuing their rule. That's the name of the game. Speaking of splitting the working class, Trump announced a new Red Scare 2.0 the other day, Scott. <laughs> um, says, I want to ban all communists from coming into the United States. And then we got to take a look at those who are already here. And, and, uh, and the crowd started shouting, keep them out, keep them out, keep, like they would lock her up. And um, do you think it's going to have any effect, Scott? Uh, I think it's going to, you know, rile up a, a certain section of uh, of his base. I think it's going to, you know, play well to them. Uh, but the idea of, you know, uh, placing, I mean, we, you know, we should say there are already uh, political restrictions on immigration, um, uh, on naturalization in particular. You can't become uh, a citizen of the United States if you um, have been a member of a, of a communist party. Uh, I mean, at least, you know, according to the, the declaration on the immigration form um, or on the, the naturalization form, rather. Um, so uh, practically, I don't think it's going to have much effect. Um, it's, a, it's a bad sign, surely, for, you know, those of us who are, who are communists here. It's a sign that there, you know, there's going to be a potentially increased crackdown. But that, that red scare idea just doesn't resonate, I think, with, with people anymore. We now have you know, an entire generation of people who, who grew up after the Cold War, you know, were not uh, indoctrinated in the same way with that, you know, rabid fear of communism. Um, and I think the, the ratcheting up the rhetoric on, you know, on the right, the anti-communist rhetoric is an attempt to kind of recapture the, the power that red baiting used to have, uh, but, but, you know, doesn't doesn't have in the same way. Not saying it's, you know, it's gone or whatever, but um, they're, they're fighting a losing battle and they know it and that's why they're yelling still loud. Rosanna, first it was the immigrants, immigrant ban, and not letting no immigrants in. Then it was the Muslims, Muslim ban. Now it's the Reds. They don't wanna, and, and you know, they just did this. At the end of Trump's administration, they reissued that 
State Department advisory. And no communists can come into this. And I think it was directed at China because there are hundreds of thousands of Chinese students studying in these United States. And it was an attempt to put pressure on uh, the, and, and that was the beginning of the sanctions against uh, Chinese goods and tariffs, not sanctions, tariffs coming into the United States. Uh, but Rosanna, it well, has domestic implications as well. You were gonna say. Don't forget that he first came after the Mexicans, you know. <laughs> But, That's you know, right. um, I, I think it's important to remember, you know, that even if you may not belong to any section of the current attacks that he's waging, you're going to eventually belong to one section of this attack. And so that, uh, I mean, unless you're Trump's family and possibly even, you know, uh, that, that the important thing is to band together and defend each other you know, defend, defend the rights of all of us, um, uh, not just as communists, but as Mexicans, as blacks, everything, because he's coming, you know, Jewish, he's, he's coming after whomever he thinks will gain him some more support and, and, and grow his base. And we can't allow that. That's what Hitler did. Uh, I, I, I don't remember the exact quote. I mean, I don't remember exactly this poem about first they came for this group, then they came for that group, but I didn't belong to this group, so I did nothing. And and he goes on and on about you know how each group they came for each group, and by the time they came for him, there was no one to defend him. And I think that's an important lesson that we need to learn right now and begin to to practice uh, in defending each other, not allowing these kinds of things to to divide us, but understanding that um, it it's. It's an attempt to gain power, and it's going to be very, very detrimental and deadly for the rest of us. Scott, that was that was Pastor Nemour. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right. He was a German theologian, religious figure, Scott, mm -hmm. and and he he said famously, first they came for the communists, but I wasn't a communist. So I did nothing. Then they came for the socialists. But I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the uh, LGBTQ people. I wasn't gay. Then they came for the uh, Roma. They didn't call them Roma then. They used another word, which is considered derogatory now. And, and then no one was left. And so Rosanna is making a good point, isn't she? If you're Absolutely. not part of this group now, you may be in the future. So what's the lesson, Scott? Well, the lesson is exactly that, the lesson that Rosanna drew from it, which is that we need to, um, first of all, recognize that uh, these attacks on one uh, vulnerable group uh, is an attack on all of us, uh, that we need to stand together against all of those attacks, that we need to build solidarity against all of those attacks. Um, and uh, another lesson to draw, I think, is the importance of, you know, of, of relationships, um, because, you know, thinking of my own situation in a, in a very small, uh, overwhelmingly conservative rural town as a communist, um, you know, there are a lot of people who might cheer for expelling or cracking down on or whatever, persecuting uh, communists um, in the abstract, but it's much harder uh, when they put a face on it. Right. It's much harder to um, think about, you know, doing that to somebody that, that you know. So um, that's another another aspect of this, like the importance of being um, visible in our communities, being in these coalitions, being uh, active. Um, that's, you know, that's part of uh, protecting ourselves and protecting our, our communities from um, from these threats. OK, news alert. They started off calling, and this was all the Republicans, everything to the left of Attila the Hun, communist. You know, that's how they started off. It wasn't just Trump. It was also the uh, Senate Majority Leader. What's his name? Mitch McConnell. 
you know, it, 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 it was also that good old boy from South Carolina. Um, all of them were, were uh, doing it. And they said Biden. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Biden is a socialist? Give me a break. And but Barack Obama, socialist, Marxist, communist, born in Kenya. Muslim. And, huh? They accused him of being a Muslim as well for a while. Muslim. And and a socialist. Yeah, that was that was part of it. And it didn't work. It didn't and don't forget that Bernie Sanders and them developed a mass move building on a socialist minded current that was already present in the country. This rising generation of young people, it's the new red generation. They're the ones who are organizing the industries, Amazon, Starbucks, they're, on the, they're going to be on the front lines of the UPS strike nurses teachers that's who is and and i tell you something else you all you ruling class people you big bourgeoisie fools you are the one that are creating your own grave diggers by outlawing affirmative action by outlawing abortion by ruling against keep on doing it you know but unless we unite in a broad coalition, we're not going to be able to fight it. That's why we say unity is imperative. This is our new pamphlet out dealing with the history of the United and Popular Fronts. You can get it at cpusa.org. Write to us at cpusa at cpusa.org and get yourself a copy of it. Let's go to our discussion question uh, before we end our show today. It reads like this. <clears throat> it's a tough one. Some say that in the later years, Brezhnev period, the USSR drifted away from internationalism. Uh, they started intervening in other countries, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Afghanistan. Was this imperialism or was this foreign intervention necessary to preserve the socialist way of life? Scott? Who? Um, well, I think part of, you know, part of what we have to recognize is that, um, Joe, you always say it's a bourgeois town, uh, you know, there, the, the rules of the game on the international scene, in a certain sense, are, are, are bourgeois as well, even though there was a strong, um, you know, socialist uh, resistance to that. Um, so uh, is, is all foreign intervention uh, imperialist? Absolutely not. Um, did, did the Soviet Union um, take steps, uh, you know, in, in attempting to um, help with liberation struggles or to preserve the, the, uh, uh, the socialist bloc or, or, or whatever that, um, that ran uh, afoul of um, some uh, currents of self-determination, perhaps. I'm, I'm not an expert on that at all. Um, it would be easier, I think, to address this in terms of uh, China's current role. Uh, China is often accused of having an imperialist foreign policy. Um, but uh, if you look at it um, in, uh, in the way uh, developing countries are, are responding to it, it's not the same at all. It's not exploitative. Um, it's uh, based on collective development and a very different uh, approach to globalization. Rosanna, it was socialism uh, from the USSR and its support that helped end the Vietnam War. It was the Soviet Union and their support for Southern African liberation that ended the rule of the Portuguese in Angola and Mozambique, uh, uh, Guinea. 
uh, it was the support that the Soviet Union and the socialist bloc GDR gave to the South Africans that helped win the defeat of apartheid. That in Cuba, Cuba sent us. So, um, what was that right or wrong? I mean, not all interventions are equal, are they? <clears throat> Yeah, I think you can't measure uh, actions just by one one um, methodology or one one what is that term one yardstick or what's one yardstick. I don't know what that yeah yeah you got we it. can't we yeah we can't do that we have to be able to really look deeper into things what were the conditions that were happening what what existed what was their motive what was the uh, you know the end result or how what was the thinking around it and we have to look, ask a lot more questions than just take a blanket statement because of one specific incident and think that that's the way everything should be. We can't do that. Uh, you know, I know we've been trained in this country to do stuff like that, where everything is either one or the other. There's like no middle ground. And that's not true. Everything blends completely. So, so always having to look deeper and ask the right questions. Don't allow yourself to just take in information without processing the information fully so that you can really understand the world and, and even better how to react to it. Uh, and, and that's true with your own personal life as well. Very important idea, you know, think independently, assess, look deeply, just don't pick up every catchphrase that you hear or read on a meme or you hear on the radio or on the tube, it ain't necessarily true. On the other hand, you can't export revolution either. You can't export socialism. It's not for, it's not for export. It has to develop according to the history and traditions and the struggle in each country in its own time. And imperialism intervenes all the time, 24 seven. And they're still intervening. So we gotta take that into account uh, as, as well. Thank you very much for listening this morning. We'll be back next week with another half hour of Good Morning Revolution. Until then, stay strong, stay safe, stay in the fight. Take care, everybody. Have a good and safe holiday. Later, comrades.